We heard earlier that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, um, but that there was probably an earlier beginning when God actually conceived and then prepared the elements for the cosmos. Um, surely that's a case of reinterpreting scripture to support your thesis, isn't it? Well, scripture can be reinterpreted. I find no problem with that. It may be that we don't understand the first few verses of scripture in, in the correct way. Uh, it would certainly be easier for the creationists um, if that were the case. We did reinterpret, but on the other hand, I'm keeping a, a completely open mind about how old the world is, how old the Earth is. In terms of the scientific evidence, it depends which dating method you go with. It depends on uh, whether you take any of the longer term uh, radioactive dating methods, which give you millions, if not billions of years as, as the age of the Earth. And it could be that the rocks and the Earth's crust is that old, and life was created maybe only a few thousand years ago. I can see that would be an easier way for um, the creationists to understand. Uh, on the other hand, as I say, I'm keeping an open mind. It may be that things are only a few thousand years old. The Earth is only a few thousand years old. Now, you've said that research funding and professional reputations and careers of the evolutionary scientists in universities depends on them towing the evolutionary orthodoxy line. Um, so how have you managed to survive at St Andrews? It's certainly true that um, creationists and intelligent designers who've opposed evolution have lost their jobs and got into trouble. I'm sure you're familiar with the Richard Sternberg case at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, I believe, who um, had, had, to, had to resign as a result of publishing an article from uh, an intelligent designer, although he's a, not an intelligent designer himself, was the editor of the journal. And um, there's uh, um, a CD called, what's it called, Expelled or something like that now, which documents uh, more cases like this. Personally, I'm not working in mainstream biology or mainstream geology, or I probably would have lost my job some time ago. But I'm working in chemistry. The work I do is very peripheral as far as evolution is concerned. And sciences like chemistry and mathematics and physics are not so penetrated by evolution as the biological sciences are. Can I ask you if you're associated with or aligned in any way to the the politically conservative Discovery Institute, um, which I believe uh, feels that intelli the intelligent designer could be the god of Christianity? I visited their website one, once or twice and read articles that are on their, are on their website and uh, I signed a list that they invite you to sign um, disagreeing with, with some some of the more extreme positions of evolutionists, but that's my only association with them. So is your, your aim to convince people that intelligent design is a scientific theory, and, and by doing so you're redefining science to accept what some would say are supernatural explanations? Yes, I think I go along with that um, to a good, a good way I would go along with that, yes. And, and do you think natural selection can ever coexist with uh, natural theology? I don't go with theistic evolution, if that's where, where you're going at the moment. No, I, I, I think that's incompatible with Christianity, as I understand Christianity. But I am happy with microevolution and the idea that some of the changes we see in nature, some of the changes that we see in biology, can be attributed to the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Now you and a few other proponents of uh, intelligent design have walked into a few walls, haven't you? I mean, the, the US National Academy of Sciences said, and, and I quote here, creationism, intelligent design, and other claims of supernatural intervention in the origin of life or, or species are not science because they're not testable by the methods of science. How do you stand up against that? The, well, I don't agree with that for a start because Lots of the predictions of intelligent design and of creationism have been tested by the methods of science in the first place. But in the second place, it depends on what your definition of science is. And one of the definitions of science, and it looks as if that's one that's 
um, at the basis of that statement from the, um, where was it? The, the United States National Academy of Sciences. National Academy of Science. And also there was criticism from the, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They're yes. coming at you from all angles. Yes, yes. You see, their definition of science excludes any intervention by God, any interventionalism at all. It has to be a naturalistic, a purely naturalistic explanation. Otherwise, they say immediately that it's non-science. They're not willing to admit that you can, you can observe uh, evidence for a designer or a creator in nature. If you try and go down that route, they say immediately that's outside of science. Um, you say detecting design um, makes no appeal to sacred books or is independent of all religious authority. Mm -hmm. So aren't you implying that uh, intellectual design, that, that lobby, is distancing itself, in effect, from scripture and from Christianity? In a sense it is, yes. I think in a sense it is. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by distancing itself from Christianity exactly. Well, if you but claim that it's independent of all religious authority, I take that as the Bible and Christian teaching. Yeah, well, it will be. Uh, I mean, the intelligent design movement does go with that. We, or when I say we, I'm not part of the intelligent design movement, but the intelligent designers are trying, are looking for evidence for a designer without recourse to inspiration or scripture or holy books of any kind. They're trying to apply what they understand to be the scientific method. Now, as you know, we've been to the birthplace of Charles Darwin. Um, in your opinion, what has he actually contributed to this debate? Darwin. Darwin. Um, Quite a bit. Uh, I agree with the idea that um, superstition is wrong and that we, sh as scientists, should oppose superstition. And I think Charles Darwin pinpointed the idea that changes in nature can be understood in terms of natural selection. And small changes in nature certainly can. There's quite good scientific evidence for things like uh, changes in finch beak sizes, changes in resistance amongst bacteria and so on. I'm quite happy with the idea that ne the neo-Darwinian mechanism accounts for these kinds of changes. I just think it's been pushed too far and those kind of small changes, big accumulations of them, can't really ac ac um, account for the origin of thrushes, sorry, the origin of finches in the first place, or the origin of bacteria in the first place. That's where I see the problems coming along. But certainly, yes, we can, we can be very happy that Darwin did discover something meaningful. There are many around you within the church that feel that, in a way, he's misled or deceived people through his, the publication of his theories. Do you think in any way he's sort of sinned or committed a crime? The, the uh, deserved fate of every scientific hypothesis is that it be tested and tried and uh, go through that kind of process. That's what happened with Darwin. He proposed a scientific hypothesis. It's gone through a massive testing process, a really massive testing process. The majority of scientists are happy with the idea that it's correct, but there's a minority of scientists, and I'm one of them, who feels that it hasn't stood up to this kind of a test. Of course, there are major philosophical and religious implications for any origin of life or any origin of species kind of theory. And so, in a sense, Darwin was always playing with fire. Um, it's a pity people can't divorce these kind of theories from their emotions. They get so emotionally involved with or origins theories. And so words like sin come in that you, were, that you were saying, and people start using words like sinning and so on. But um, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go along with that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he's, he's certainly at the moment being vilified in the religious press and, and other media. Um, is, is that justified? Is, is there a certain amount of character assassination directed towards Darwin? I don't think they should focus their um, attacks on Darwin himself. So much more is known now about species, particularly about DNA and the genetic basis of life, now than was known in Darwin's time, that um, 
they should focus their attacks more on people like Richard Dawkins, who publish books like The God Delusion, and who are really attacking and uh, not doing, and, and from a propaganda point of view, attacking religion rather than rather than Charles Darwin. I mean, you mentioned Dawkins, and he's a, an Oxford professor highly regarded, and he claims that uh, those with your religious convictions believe that they shouldn't be questioned. Um, and it, he challenges you at every opportunity, but then he in turn is being ridiculed at the moment. Um, is, it, is all this getting out of hand? In a sense it is, yes, I think. Um, there's very little meeting of minds, but I think Dawkins likes to set up straw men and caricature creationists and religious people. And he says, for example, that all faith is blind faith, which really, I mean, ignores what 20 cent centuries of theological discussion amongst um, Christians and theologians trying to distinguish what is truth and what is dross. And uh, every true Christian every real Christian always questions what he believes, the background and the basis of it. Aren't you playing your part in this battle? Because uh, uh, you've, you've written that uh, those that champion intelligent design are intelligent thinkers. I mean, what does that say about those that disagree with you? As long as they um, limit themselves to rational argumentation, that's fine. But when they use propaganda, when they set up straw men, when they ridicule, when they use ridicule, when they say, like uh, Richard Dawkins does, that everybody that disagrees with um, e evolution, everybody doesn't accept evolution, must be stupid or insane or wicked, then um, I, I can't can't go along with them. Now you've said that complex mechanical and electronic machines are the products of intelligent minds uh, and that supports the view um, that because the cosmos is complex it must be the product of intelligent design and where's the logic in that it's not just the complexity of the cosmos that shows it may very well be the product of intelligent design it's the um, it's the specified complexity. We see a pattern that makes sense from the point of view of an intelligent mind in certain aspects of the cosmos. There are some complex things which um, don't imply any intelligent mind behind them. They may be very complex, but there's no specificity. There's no kind of pattern behind them. So uh, that's really what we're saying. Can I ask you if, if you, through your academic study, have found any factual evidence to substantiate the case for intelligent design? Where's the evidence, John? In um, The Origin of Life itself, in that, if it were a chance process, I mean, we don't know exactly how small the first living organism was, but if it was a, a bacterium, and bacteria are the smallest living organisms that can reproduce themselves, and the smallest of the bacteria, it's got uh, 160,000 base pairs in its DNA. It can't actually reproduce itself, that one, but um, the smallest one that can reproduce itself completely on its own has over 300,000 base pairs in its DNA. So that's a lot of DNA. That's a lot of base pairs in DNA. Now, where did the information for that come from? It's easy to show using uh, statistics that the chances of that happening by random, a piece of DNA that long, or even much, much shorter than that, just assembling itself by chance, even in a, even in a pool of nucleotides, is zero. No matter how long, no matter how old the Earth is, if the Earth is 10 billion years old, if we allow um, reactions to occur at the fastest known rate for chemical reactions, there's still no way even a very short piece of DNA containing the kind of information that's needed for the origin of life, it simply can't have happened in the time needed. Exactly the same is true for a simple um, stre stretch of an enzyme where amino acids link together. You, you find exactly the same rationale. So, to my mind, uh, life can't have originated by chance, and I'm speaking as a, as a scientist now, 
The evidence is very, very strong. It simply cannot have happened by chance. And therefore, to me, this seems to be rather good evidence. Maybe it's not completely conclusive, but rather good evidence that there must have been a mind behind it. Add to that the origin of the code, the genetic code, where enzymes interact with DNA. This is where you see the specified complexity that I was talking about. We have a code developing. Now, a code is something that implies a mind, an intelligence behind it. And that's exactly what we see in the um, nucleus of even the smallest cell. I, I was going to ask you if you have... Uh, if at any time intelligent design has ever been subjected to scientific research or to rigorous testing. You've hinted once or twice that you feel it, it has, um, but your proponents of intelligent design claim you can't prove ID by experiment. Uh, now, as a scientist, do you consider that something of a cop-out? Well, you can't prove almost anything. I mean, you can't prove your mother loves you. There's almost nothing you can prove I mean, we even know now, thanks to Gödel's incompleteness theorems, that even within a simple mathematical system, apparently watertight, there are things that you can't prove. So I intelligent designers won't be able to prove to the satisfaction of um, die-hard evolutionists that intelligent design is true, in the same way that it's impossible to prove that neo-Darwinian evolution in any absolute sense of the word prove. You've just got to look at the evidence and decide whether you feel the evidence is strong for one side or the other. And I think there is good evidence. And, and you've said that the, the Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor and other colleagues at the University um, don't react to your views. Is, is there ever any discussion? Universities are big places and my contact with the Vice-Chancellor or the Principal is not that, is not that strong. But I think most academics are just keeping their heads down in this, in this debate. You know, you put your head up and then the same thing will happen to you as happened to Michael Rice. You'll be forced into resignation right away. So I have my website. They can read my articles on there if they wish to. But most of my colleagues simply keep their heads down and don't react one way or another. Let's be fanciful. If one sweet day you meet Charles Darwin in heaven, what are you going to say to him? You were wrong. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you here. <laughs>